Good afternoon and welcome to Data Matters. Um, this week I'm delighted to introduce you to two guests, Robert and Dan. Uh, more on that in a sec. Let me just set the scene for today. We've got two fantastic guests. Um, I'll start with Robert. Robert uh, Carolina is an ICT and intellectual property lawyer, author of Cybok. Is that the right pronunciation? Is that what we it call sure it? It sure is. Yep. Yeah, Cybok Law and Regulation. Uh, knowledge areas. He is a university lecturer, advises uh, advisor to financial institutions and other large enterprise users, vendors, startups. He's also a public speaker and uh, continuing with his education uh, provision to to many many people. So good afternoon to you, Robert. Good afternoon, and thank you for being. Um, our next guest uh, today is uh, Dan Orhoff. Uh, Dan is the founder of Orhoff Technology and IP Law. He is a notable and well-respected lawyer in this field. And Dan's expertise is derived from both academic and practical experience. He was former head of the international Israeli-based law firm, um, IT, Internet and Copyright Department. And Dan has an intimate knowledge on technology and innovation. And this is evident in his appearance as special advisor before the Israeli Parliament on economic affairs and constitutional laws and the justice committees, as well as justice and finance. He's an influential figure in uh, both domestic and beyond. And in fact, uh, Dan and I have bumped heads many times and sat on panels together. Uh, and, and seeing each other um, probably in Brussels and London mainly. And he also writes um, professional reports for both legal and economic platform. And of course, contributes to um, publications such as Data Guidance and the IIPP and Nimity, et cetera. Uh, pleased to have you here, Dan. Thanks, Steve. Same here. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So listen, um, audience we we every week we try to bring you something that's relevant that's um you know current and the last few weeks have been uh, quite an interesting affair we, we last week we were doing brexit um which was <laughs> somewhat uh, i mean I, I found it excellent and torturous at the same time but um the week before that we were doing effective privacy programs from two dpos and sort of hearing from their stories but we started the series with um, Schrems 2, of course. And so this kind of uh, episode follows in that sequence, really, that naturally that, OK, so if we're looking at, you know, from a Schrems perspective, if we're looking from a Brexit from here from the UK perspective. Also, what do we mean and what happens around cloud and cloud security and cloud provision and outsourcing, basically, because this is very, very topical. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, before I start with my first question um, over to uh, Robert, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sort of flavour, if you like, about what, what we're talking about here today. So um, just to remind everyone, outsourcing is the business practice of hiring a third party company to provide and perform services. Um, traditionally done in house and basically you get to a point where either you're you're too big or you need to grow or you don't have that expertise so you look for an outsourcing or a third party provider it's typically seen as a cost cutting measure um, but actually uh, cloud computing and the you know the onset of uh, subscription based services saas pass etc have made us think more about the effectiveness and the scalability of these solutions, which 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 is you know absolutely um, prevalent if you are a growing business or a new business and you want to expand into different areas. What better way than doing it via the cloud? Um, ultimately, both models, um, both in the cloud and in an outsourcing environment, provide um, many many different benefits, flexibility, scalability, the management. In fact, it can take the entire headache out of IT. And I can tell as a small business, taking the headache out of IT would be an absolute delight. <laughs> so if you know anyone who wants to do that for us, please see me afterwards. Um, we are um, 
in a ta in an age where basically outsourcing and cloud provision is just the norm but we have to consider the unique legal implications of this now with all these different laws over 120 countries different privacy laws and we've got other things such as security um, e-discovery issues and so it might not always be a shortcut or it might not be the situation where you can just outsource this risk so even though there are many cost benefits, there are some really um, and there's some very compelling reasons to have these services outsourced. Um, we do have a degree of risk. And so I would like to ask Robert, um, given his vast superior knowledge on, on, on cloud security and in particular the US Cloud Act and recent uh, Microsoft filing case, I just wanted Robert's opinion on you know those types of risks and and in you know in particular those that act and those particular cases. Robert? Sure thank you very much Steve. Um, first I want to say that's probably the biggest build-up I've ever received from <laughs> anybody uh, at any conference, any panel, uh, anywhere on the planet. So so thank you for that. I, if you have a recording of this I want to put that uh, somewhere in the vault. Um, I think the, the where I begin with this is a subject that some people are referring to now as uh, the problem of digital sovereignty. Uh, and specifically, if we look at the U.S. Cloud Act and what that's a response to, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to bore you for just a moment with an incredibly important story that some listeners are already familiar with, but some might not be. Mm -hmm. And this is the story of uh, part of the US government, one of the security services going to Microsoft a few years ago and serving them with a type of warrant that said, we want you Microsoft to turn over all records under your control that relate to, and they named an individual. We don't know the individual's name, that, that's been kept secret. And they said, because we think that this person is one of your customers. Now, Microsoft's response was, well, as it happens, yes, you're you're absolutely right. This person is a customer of one of our uh, on one of our platforms. Uh, I believe an email customer. But here's the problem, U.S. government: we don't store those records here in the U.S. We store them on our server in Dublin, Ireland. So they're not here in the United States. Now, the government's response was, well, they might not be here in the United States, but you, Microsoft Corporation are and these records are under your control aren't they and microsoft from an engineering perspective said well yeah i mean we can get to them well you know just, let's just cross-examine you a little bit do you have engineers who can access these files yes uh, can you copy them yes even though they're all the way in dublin sure and can you get them onto a usb key or something yes is that expensive or cheap it's cheap all right that's the magic formula for a judge to say, well, that's within the, the, the remit of what U.S. law says we're allowed to ask for. Now, in fact, the case became incredibly contentious and it worked its way through the federal court system all the way to the Supreme Court on this narrow issue of whether or not the U.S. law should properly be interpreted as extending to requests like this. And while everybody around the world was holding their breath about what will the court do, the U.S. Congress rolled in and said, well, we can fix this. We'll just change the law. And that's where the Cloud Act comes from. And the U.S. Cloud Act makes it super clear beyond question that what Congress meant and what they mean when they say that you're allowed to ask for these records under your control, you can the records might be stored on a server in Ireland or in Tel Aviv or in any other place on the planet or on the moon. If you have effective control over them, then U.S. legal process might be able, under certain circumstances, to demand that you turn over those records. Now, this is only the most recent version of a story that seems to repeat with some regularity over the course of the last 20 years or so. But it certainly does reflect the environment we live in today, and it's something that risk managers need to think about when they start architecting their cloud solutions. Wow, thank, <laughs> thank you, Robert. That that, 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 brilliant. Thank you very much. That's that, that's great um, insights, <laughs> and um, uh, it's great to get the the history of that. Just, I mean, just on that. What, what, what? How long ago are we talking this particular case? Just from a 
Uh, the case hit the Supreme Court, I think it was around 2018, something okay. like that. So this is the last right. couple of years. Um, and then the Cloud Act came mm -hmm. in, obviously passed by Congress and then signed by the current president. This isn't the first time a case like this has happened. The same thing happened outside the context of cloud services to SWIFT, the interbank funds transfer organization, yes. in the mid-2000s when another, some agency mm -hmm. of the U.S. government asked them to disclose records held on their servers in the U.S. Uh, that eventually got out and became the source of diplomatic tension. Everybody got angry because said, well, in answering a legal request from one jurisdiction, we think we're actually violating legal rights in another. Now that was sorted out diplomatically. So there's a, an arrangement in place that discusses how far can people go. But in this later case, the, the, the Microsoft case and the Cloud Act, it's not exactly that clear. I mean, the Cloud Act makes it clear that under certain circumstances, a U.S. judge can force an organization, if they have the technological capability, to turn over documents in full knowledge and awareness that that might violate the rules of another place. Now, the law cautions judges not to do it too often. By the way, I've said U.S. a whole lot of times here. I don't want people to get the misimpression that this is only a U.S. thing. This is just one instance of a process that we are seeing repeated all around the world. And when you get right down to it, a sovereign state that's in the business of protecting its residents from threats, that's in the business of enforcing its laws in its country, I can just about guarantee that they will time after time after time when confronted with this choice say, yes, if you can get that information to us, then we want it and we want it now. Right. Thank you, uh, Robert. That <laughs> um, Amazing uh, insights. Thank you very much for making that so clear. Um, Dan, I, I mean, <laughs> if you're, well, first of all, you might want to come back on, 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 on what Robert was saying there, but sure. Yeah. I, I, well, I do have well, another question. It's sort of related, but you you go ahead. Let's let's hear from you. Sure. That well, first of all, that was very definitely illuminating. Uh, I just want to add my you know my current experience uh, uh, just to add to um, what what's happening uh, now in terms of uh, U.S. federal agencies uh, that require data and especially personal data, personal information from entities uh, that are not based. Uh, within the U.S., and I was recently involved with uh, two of them. One of one was with the SEC, with the Security Exchange um, Federal Security Ex Exchange Commission, and the other, which is currently um, oh, in a, on an ongoing pr um, process, is a CID, a uh, Civil Investigative uh, Demand by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and apparently they were asking and. Um, an Israeli company who has uh, uh, was conducting business in the U.S. Uh, to disclose certain data that relates to personal information about Israelis, not about uh, U.S. Uh, citizens, but apparently that information and those individuals are relevant to the FTC investigation. And that data resides on AWS sites within the U.S and the FTC requires the Israeli company to disclose this information. And uh, one of their arguments is that, well, the data is already in the, in the, on AWS sites uh, within the US, why won't you disclose this type of information? But apparently Israeli data transfer laws, uh, personal data transfer laws, one of the provisions under uh, regulations here in Israel is that you cannot there is no onward transfer, unlike EU laws, for example. You cannot simply transfer the data from one entity to another, from one recipient to another. Uh, so it creates um, a whole discussion, a whole regulatory international type of discussion on whether uh, the FTC has jurisdiction and the ability to enforce this type of data transfer of the disclosure of data uh, while the Israeli company faces violations of their own local laws in disclosing uh, the requested data. So this is just an ongoing process and it may be that um, it eventually will see some, some form of decisions or, um, or an action taken by the FTC, but that's, uh, that's uh, for the future. We, cannot, we don't know yet. Uh, 
uh, we're hopeful that it will be um, uh, settled um, without any uh, further so, proceedings. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I, mean, this, I, mean, I knew this was going to be a great subject. We've already got some fantastic questions coming in. And I, um, just on the back of that, one of the questions that's come through is, I mean, is this going to happen for a European citizen? Is under GDPR? Can, could this type of scenario, this is a question to both of you, could, could this scenario happen if, if it was uh, a European citizen? Yes, absolutely. No hesitation. Uh, why, that would make absolutely no difference whatsoever, um, uh, at least in at least in jurisdictional theory. Now, one thing about the Cloud Act, the, the one redeeming grace that it has, is it does caution a U.S. federal judge to think really long and hard before ordering someone to break the law of another country. But it does say, you know, when all said and done, if you need the information, then and it's in the, you know, it's in, you know, significant interest to the country or something like that, you have the authority to do it. I mean, the 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 challenge here is that the way that the law works and the way that courts gain jurisdiction, they gain jurisdiction over people, not technology. And I think that in this field, one of the challenges is so many people get focused on where is the server or what is the location of the data. They lose focus on what is actually a more important question and that what is the location of the living individuals able to address, control, interdict, change the contents of, or release the confidentiality of that data. So the number one thing from my perspective to look at is where are the people who can make a difference in the life of this data and which sovereign states have the ability to influence through legal process the actions of those people yeah um uh, I, i'm thank you I, and um I've, I've got loads more questions coming through i, I i'm trying to stay on our <laughs> on our themes here but i knew we would get uh, pulled into some great questions from the audience. So keep them coming, they're fantastic. I might not get a chance to read them all, but I'd certainly do my best. Um, okay, so so I think what would be really good, um, and, and it sort of answers some of the questions that are coming through, because um, one of the questions, you know, and we were talking about previously prior to the show was, you know, we're, we're in a, a, a huge period of transformation, global regulatory landscape. It, I mean, it's, and the uncertainty of Schrems to Brexit, but just to mention a couple, you know, there are definite winners and losers. What would be your, you know, how can we advise our businesses um, on, you know, the minim how to minimise the level of disruption? Uh, you know, what would be your advice around that? Let's, I'll, I'll start with Dan and then go uh, across to um, Robert. Dan? I assume that uh, m most of us, if not all of us, are um, very well acquainted with um, with the process of vendor risk assessment and vendor risk management. And there are a lot of things that you need to um, um, examine and test and assess in relation to um, uh, the vendors in order to um, make sure that you manage the risks associated with that vendor properly. And, and data transfer has become another major issue that you need to put into consideration and at the time being we're left with um, uh, more question marks uh, than than answers at the moment and uh, you know um, as far as i recall i think that the eu commission has stated a couple months back that uh, they will uh, come out with um, or publish um, some um, a new version of the uh, standard contractual clauses in order for companies to better understand what exactly they need to do in order to transfer data to other countries with uh, which are not um, which do not have the the adequacy recognition but uh, it's not happening yet so um, and we we also know and this is something that um, um, you know, I've seen in, in many cases uh, uh, for the past weeks, uh, a lot of companies her, have turned uh, from uh, the privacy shield, which was invalidated, to the standard contractual clauses, which is apparently not inval invalidated. But if you um, take a good read of the Schrems too, the, the, the SECs are simply not enough. Um, and, um, and what we see is that companies are 
practically uh, adding the SECs as is to their uh, DPAs to the data processing addendums, and and of course this is not uh, this is not a proper solution under the CJU's uh, decision. Um, so uh, we're left with um, some um, you know trying to and you know as advisors and councils we uh, uh, there's no one size fits them all, but uh, we're trying to uh, make a sort of a case by case analysis and see what would fit best to the situations. In some cases, we use the derogations that are offered for specific situations under Article 49, but they're not the right solution for every case. Uh, in, other, uh, in other cases, um, at least in one case that I can, you know, I can mention, um, we've, uh, one of the solutions that, that we've come up uh, was that instead of a transfer of digital information uh, online uh, through um, uh, online networks, uh, the di digital information will be downloaded to a hard drive, uh, a secured hard drive, and will be shipped with a courier to uh, um, a country which is outside of the EU. So uh, we can to uh, sort of um, uh, make um, uh, sort of a position that that digital data is not subject to potential uh, surveillance by foreign um, foreign intelligence authorities. So this is, uh, and again, so th this is just was just a, you know um, a, a specific uh, solution that we've come up and that was right to the point. But um, but as I said, uh, uh, until we have uh, some sort of a very definite type of solutions of mechanisms, new mechanisms that are introduced either by the EU itself or through uh, agreements between the EU and the US or the EU and other countries, uh, we're just left with case-by-case -case analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, Robert, I, the questions are building. Uh, it's, it's like a tsunami is going to come around the corner. Oh, and, my so, gosh. Yeah, oh my I gosh. Know, for, for, <laughs> brace yourself, gentlemen. Um, well, so, Robert, any, any thoughts on that uh, just to add? Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, I would agree with absolutely everything Dan just said, uh, particularly with respect to the standard contractual clauses. Um, I think the court, uh, from, from my perspective, I think what the court is saying, hey, standard contractual clauses, yeah, that's great, unless you just sign them up and ignore them, which, let's face it, over the history of standard contractual clauses is what, is, is what an uncomfortably large number of organizations did. I remember being asked at a conference years ago, how is it that signing a piece of paper is equivalent to giving protection to data subjects, to which my answer was because somehow we managed to convince policymakers that was enough. Well, the court is now saying that's not enough. You have to live these things. You have to actually examine what your obligations are and, and work into it, and people sign them up have to enforce them. Now, at the technological level, one thing that I think people should be thinking about is depends on whether or not they're going out for infrastructure as a service or at the other end, software as a service. So for people doing infrastructure as a service, there are any number of, let's say, super clever technological solutions usually built around some form of cryptography that can give them some degree of assurance that no matter where their data is stored, that they will continue to maintain effective control over the content. Now, of course, that's only true to the extent that they're doing key management themselves and not relying on the infrastructure as a service provider's key management service. Now, am I saying don't trust infrastructure as a service providers? No, I did not say that. I do not say that. I'm saying that you only really know what you've got if you're managing keys yourself. Bear in mind, though, even at that level of infrastructure as a service and using key management to your advantage, you're only reducing the risk that you will lose the confidential character of data or that you might lose the integrity of the data. That will help you. But no amount of crypto is going to stop an attack or a disruption based on availability of the data. So, you know, if somebody decides to interfere, how many businesses would say, well, yeah, we don't know what's in there. We just know you're not getting to it. That's not really a great business model to pursue. But for people who then go out to find software as a service, you know, I don't know how to run a software as a service business without actually disclosing data to the vendor. So crypto isn't really sort of an effective solution on what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. I can make, maybe add, uh, Stephen, yeah, yeah, another, go ahead, another huge hurdle, and that is, um, you know, the standard contractual clauses were drafted and, and put in place uh, 
uh, in the times of the Data Protection Directive. Uh, and it's well addressed to data exporters which are established within the EU. Now, the GDPR has changed uh, the situation uh, and there are literally hundreds of thousands of um, non-EU entities which are data controllers that need to comply with the GDPR, including data transfer uh, aspects. And the SECs, as they are, they're simply, they, they do not address uh, non-EU data controllers, data exporters. So, um, so for example, um, um, an Israeli company which, is, which needs to comply with the GDPR as a data controller under the provisions of the GDPR, simply cannot use the standard contractual clauses because um, the Israeli company is simply not established within the EU. Uh, so, um, so that's another hurdle that I'm really hopeful that the EU Commission will address when they will introduce a new version of uh, data transfer mechanisms because um, um, it's, it's become a sort of a fictitious uh, act, not just to sign the, the SECs, without reading them, but to sign the SECs uh, while knowing that um, you cannot really comply with them. Yeah, and, and um, thank you. I, I, I've got loads of questions to choose from, but um, and, we're, and we're nearly sort of moving into the, the, the Q&A section. session. Um, I've got just, I mean, I, I want to ask this question because it's, it's, it's sort of like slightly cheeky, but I like it. Um, and it came in anonymously. So, you know, it said, uh, <laughs> given the, this is sort of on the back of what you said, Dan, given, given the, um, uh, what type of evidence would suffice to show you're an organisation adhering to SECs if you were looking to defend your position? So, <laughs> either of you want to answer or, or give some insights to our listeners on that? Um, the simple answer uh, would be that uh, you cannot really provide all the necessary evidence in order to show that you're compliant pursuant to what the CJU uh, requires, because uh, essentially the CJU requires the recipient of the data, the data importer, to show that the 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 the, the governance, that the uh, the atmosphere, the legal atmosphere in in the uh, target uh, territory, the recipient's uh, territory, provides adequate protection um, that complies or adheres to both the requirements of the GDPR and to the uh, Charter, uh, the EU Charter of Human Rights. And we don't really know what uh, intelligence security agencies can do or cannot do. Uh, and uh, assuming that uh, they have abilities, and probably in many countries, uh, those agencies are, you know, that they're they're conducting covert um, monitoring activities that you're not aware of, and. Uh, and, and so, how can a private company can provide, can you know, produce uh, uh, complete evidence that um, the uh, processing of the personal data in in that territory, in a specific territory, is uh, complies fully complies with, with the EU principles and norms? Uh, this is practically impossible, uh, in my view. Uh, you no, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, Robert, uh, do, you, do, do, do you want to add anything else? I've got another question which I'm really keen to get. Well, then, then, then shoot it out there, Steve. Well, well ultimately, <laughs> look, you know, this this is fantastic. And I knew, I knew uh, uh, having spoken to you both uh, on occasions that we were going to get down into the nitty gritty quite quickly. Um, there is a great question that's lining up, which which is kind of comes to the end of our <laughs> questioning which is what, what what do you do on a Monday morning and how do you advise your business on <laughs> given, given what Dan and you've just said but but before we jump to that um look we we know we, we, you know as professionals we can't you can't outsource the reputation your organization's reputation right we know that so you um trying to think like uh maybe maybe you know you're exploring this for the first time you've not outsourced before what kind of advice would you give you know if, if you were starting right at the beginning of this process um robert what what kind of things would you say what are the lookouts or the kind of things you'd advise someone uh who's new to this 
Well, if we're talking about someone uh, resident in the EU, resident in the UK, that's uh, going into the cloud and they haven't really been there before, it in part, it depends on the nature of the business they're in. So, for example, if they're processing sensitive personal data like healthcare data, um, my opening advice would be you're not leaving this country with that data. Just don't do it. Um, you know, you're going to find a cloud service provider who can give you an absolute assurance that data and control of data remains physically uh, within the borders of the country. It's just too high a risk at this point in time. Um, on the other hand, if you're processing other types of, of business data, then, uh, you know, again, if you're looking at moving into an infrastructure as a service environment, number one, you need to actually invest money in business process of assuring yourself about who you're dealing with. And this is where the tension comes in. Because businesses move into an outsourcing model and they move into a cloud service model because uh, finance officers just love it because it's like, oh my gosh, I can I can reduce my operating costs from all the way up here to all the way down there. And then you get people like me and Dan who come along and spoil the party by saying, <laughs> well, yeah, but if you're going to do that, you need to invest in people who understand how to manage and audit and migrate. And it's like, oh my God, I got to spend money. I thought I was going to save money. Well, you have to spend money to save money. And a lot of times the biggest way to reduce risk in this space is by upping the number of people on your team who know how to address this risk at a technological and business process level. So yeah, lots of tricks in the legal bag that you know we can deploy and uh, binding corporate rules, for example, is a, is a nice one now that they're available on provi service provider side, you know, the data processor side. And some software as a service providers have already started to march down that path. So maybe that will emerge as a favored new, um, a favored new candidate. So yeah, th there's a lot that can be done. I mean, it's, it's not like it's all dark and all hopeless and all gloom. On the contrary, it's just different. <laughs> I'm glad you've given us uh, a glimmer of hope there. Dan, was there any anything else you, you, you want to add to that? Because uh, uh, if not, I've got a, an, another question lined up for you. Well, d just a couple notes, uh, you know, my own, uh, sort of a, my proactive approach, my positive type of approach uh, uh, towards engaging with uh, uh, cloud-based services and, and, and other vendors. Uh, I think the, the three points that I would uh, look uh, into and uh, maybe put a focus on. The first is to look what exactly the um, vendor has done in terms of uh, data protection by design. I think that um, vendors that uh, publish, you know, through white papers, uh, statements and other other types of publications, uh, the way that they design the, their uh, product or service in order to uh, apply good principles of privacy and security. That's something that not all vendors do and when you see them it means that they're much more serious than other, others uh, and this is something that um, I particularly look into. The other, uh, the second issue is um, and that's uh, you know specifically from uh, from a uh, information security standpoint, uh, a lot of um, a lot of companies are uh, satisfied by the fact that the vendor can produce uh, um, standard certifications, ISO certifications, uh, etc. This is um, far from uh, enough uh, because it's just a framework and it doesn't mean anything about what the company does substantially. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of uh, information security uh, controls. So look for some deeper dive and, and use your information security officers to uh, help you with it. Uh, SOC 1, SOC 2 reports, uh, uh, statement of applicability uh, documents under the ISO 27000 uh, family, etc. This is something that will provide you some more in-depth in understanding of how the vendor uh, secures the data properly. And the, the, and the third, is and and I'll give it that um, with, with an example. Um, I use Zoom uh, as a video conference, as my favorite uh, video conference. And and you know, uh, Zoom uh, had a lot of information security uh, issues uh, uh, lately. Uh, they were hit with a class action. Uh, Zoom bombing was a term coined after Zoom uh, um, because of all you know internet trolls that uh, barge in uh, video conference calls. But I think that those vendors that experienced uh, breaches and information security flaws and, and these are the types of vendors that are usually much more mature than other vendors in terms of complying with uh, information security and, and, and privacy uh, and, and privacy aspects. So uh, I would definitely look uh, 
at them rather than those who are not uh, did not experience any incidents, major incidents and breaches. Well, thank you, Dan. That's um, very good advice. And one thing that I I learned, <clears throat> uh, a, 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 you know, a long time ago, and was around the exit. You know, so so when it comes to maybe transitioning from one provider to another, what kind of thoughts or advice would you give about, you know, termination of services or or, or, or transitioning from one provider to the next provider? Because Obviously, there's a lot of investment, as you pointed out, Robert, right at the beginning, um, you know, uh, 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 in terms of that cost of bringing on board or outsourcing, there's still a cost involved with that in time and in sort of capital. So what about the, the transition to another supplier or, or getting out of an agreement? What's your thoughts around that, Robert? Oh, getting out of an agreement. Well, this is the... Um... This is the unicorn of all tr um, outsourcing transactions, isn't it? Uh, once you outsource something, how do you how do you get away from the outsourcing company? Uh, I in in the many years I've been doing this, I've only ever seen one circumstance where customers leave outsourcing agreements, um, major ones, and that's when the outsourcing company decides they can't make money doing this anymore and they kick the customer out. Uh, it's it's you know then again maybe I've just had a series of bad experiences I you know you 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 only call firemen to the scene of a fire don't you maybe Dan has a different experience but I always get called when the building's burning down um, it's this problem of lock-in is endemic within technology it's always been a problem with software and connected systems uh, people doing procurement know that ex pre-existing vendors have a huge head start they always get more points on a balanced scorecard uh, because of pre-existing stuff. And I think that those kinds of observations continue to be absolutely correct, if particularly at the at the higher value add end of cloud, which is to say software as a service and platform as a service. It's always going to be difficult to migrate out of those kind of value add environments because you're getting sort of like end user functionality is the deliverable. On the other hand, when you're looking at infrastructure as a service, I, I don't know for sure, but the rather informal feedback I've had is that, you know, migrating from one person who's giving you a large number of bit buckets to somebody else who's giving you a large number of bit buckets. It, it's not the simplest thing on the face of the earth, particularly if you've got an enormous amount of data, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's doable. And those guys are competing with each other uh, regularly to try to figure out how to do it. I, I love in particular these various solutions where somebody drives up in a semi-trailer truck, a lorry, you know, with a giant, you know, petabyte style, you know, portable uh, data facility. It says, yeah, we're just going to suck all the data out of this facility and then we're going to put it on the road, the physical road and take it to another location. I mean, I, I love big engineering solutions like that. So I guess there it's sort of like, well, it's it's the same risk, only different, but on the infrastructure as a service side, little little easier, I think, to make the migration. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Dan? Uh, yeah, yeah, of, of course. I mean, you know, I always tell um, our clients that a good uh, prenuptial agreement uh, needs to include <laughs> a divorce settlement agreement in it. Um, uh, so you know, and and there are of course uh, the separation separation uh, terms uh, are extremely uh, important in terms of uh, transition period, uh, record keeping, data migration, documentation, etc. There's a whole bunch of uh, of aspects that needs to be covered when you execute the agreement, and not uh, um, and what and not when you need to separate from the uh, from the vendor. But this is. Of course, relevant specifically to more customized types of uh, services. When you talk about standard services, the uh, average uh, standard terms would uh, provide that you have like 90 days uh, to migrate your data elsewhere, and uh, we're not committed to provide you any assistance in it. That will be something that you will see in a lot of uh, um, standard terms of agreements by uh, cloud-based services. So this is something that uh, definitely needs to be uh, explored in order to better understand uh, what would it take uh, for you in practice to uh, migrate the data either to your own systems or to another vendor's uh, uh, systems. And I totally agree that uh, th this is something that needs to be well planned ahead in time, especially for critical business um, functions.
No, brilliant. So, gents, we, we are rapidly, as I thought, we are rapidly running out of time and <laughs> and I didn't get to ask the best question, which, which um, and I, I can see the questions. Um, th thank you, audience, for your questions. They are some really good questions. There's some statements in there as well. Um, some correct, some incorrect, but there you go. Um, uh, but what I, um, you know, uh, the moderators, uh, our guests here, will see them, and and then if if we can take some of them offline, if we don't get a chance to answer them all, um, I've just got a, a more of a question around um, data security. I was picking up on something that you said earlier, Dan, because you know we all know that ultimately we you know all these cases, British Airways, you know it's ages before they come and tell us the customers. Uh, it seems to be there's a breakdown in communication between their senior management and the security incident team or the IT incident team. What, what you know, if, if there's anything that you could advise us um, around that, if we were entering into an outsourcing agreement, what would it be? And then I'm going to ask um, Robert for his closing thoughts next on sort of your top tips so that I can go Monday morning to my boss and say, we've got to outsource because of this. But Dan, <laughs> uh, just your thoughts on the security and the, uh, um, and your experience, I know. So, Well, the, there is, of course, a lot to talk about it, but I would, if I can, you know, just provide one tip, it would be get personal. Uh, get, yeah, get, get personal uh, in, in, in terms of uh, get to know, get, uh, you know, intimate acquaintance uh, with the relevant stakeholders um, at your vendors, uh, the security officers, the security director, uh, privacy officers, get to know them, get to know them in, in the process of the engagement, get on, you know, on personal basis, uh, uh, the direct phone numbers, uh, their email addresses, uh, get in touch with them once in a while even if you don't really have to but just to maintain the communications direct communications but it could prove extremely useful especially uh when there's an incident going on um so um that would be my uh thank you tip about it yeah no that's brilliant that's brilliant because um i've got one of the comments that have come through from the audience about the cloud security alliance um uh code of conduct is that uh robert is that something you're familiar with any uh, you know i'm not asking you to endorse anything on on live tv but is, is no it, risk <laughs> <laughs> is it something that you would recommend our viewers even at least look at or um i i have to confess i i'm not familiar with the with the document i've heard of the organization but i'm not familiar with the document uh having not seen it um you know a code of conduct that that's wonderful however the kind of problems i'm talking about are not going to be solved with a self-regulatory scheme right. i don't think that'll do it you know you just have to you have to be able to see audit and prove the reality of the sophistication of the vendor and one of the reasons people like aws have really become as big as they are is because they had to invest an enormous amount of localization of their data centers because they throw around a lot of high bandwidth traffic just in the process of selling stuff and showing stuff available for sale. They're the accidental inheritors of the of the global you know, infrastructure of the future. And some of their competitors raced to catch up. So in terms of things to look for, this has now become an investment show. It's like invest in people <laughs> who are who are putting money into localization. For that matter, you know, Dan, would get, you need to get your top tips for companies in Israel because, of course, you guys have the benefit of an existing adequacy finding with the European Union, which means you've got a great export market that still goes, whereas all of us in the UK are like sitting on the edge of our chair saying, how are we going to sell services <laughs> into the European Union after December the 31st because it doesn't look like we're getting an easy ride. But I guess that was the topic for discussion last week so you know. it certainly was uh, <laughs> um, thank you I, I knew this show was going to be good and sadly we have actually run out of time as always um, data matters is um, a weekly show brought to you by privacy culture 
we aim to uh, just, you know, take away some of the mystery, add a little bit of humour, and uh, we've certainly had that in spades today. Uh, Dan, I've just got, you know, I've got intimate relationships and prenups just playing around in my head <laughs> in terms of cloud. <laughs> it's totally changed it for me. So, um, but thank you to you both. Um, let, let, next week, we're, we're, we, we've got a, a, another um, interesting topic of um, marketing. So uh, do tune in for that. We've got uh, Anthony Lee, who's a partner at uh, Rosenblatt, and we've got um, uh, we've we've got John Richardson, who's um, in the DM, who works for the DMA, the um, Digital Marketing um, uh, Association, I think it is. And uh, both of them come with a lot of experience in the whole marketing space. So we're going to unpack that next week and we're going to look at things like direct marketing. We'll look at cookies. You know, we're, we're, we'll be all over the place. I'm sure all around marketing. So if you are in marketing, if you have anything to do with marketing or if you want to invite your colleagues and your friends from the marketing departments, then please do so. So tune in for that. That's obviously half term week. So. I appreciate many, many people will will have kids climbing. Um, I've locked all mine outside the office. They're all dying to get in here. Um, but thank you very much from me and my business partner, Vicky. Uh, thank you again to Dan, Robert and uh, for everyone for tuning in this week. It's been a wonderful show and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.